Good evening, Golden Gate. How are we doing today? All right. Good evening, Golden Gate. Those who are streaming, uh, we are in our second week of Gate University. The title of this course is called The Blessing. And The Blessing, it talks about all of us inside of us crave from a blessing or good words from important people in our life, our mother, our father, maybe a sibling, maybe a friend. And this class that we talked about last week really tells us how to deal with that. And so we had a great time last week. We broke out in groups. We had good discussion. Uh, Matthew White was our teacher last week. He's going to come back again this week. He's going to lead this lesson again. And I can't wait to see what he's going to talk about. Amen? All right, so let's go to God in prayer. But before we do that, let's give God a big hand of plant, plant, big hand of a uh, clap for blessing us. How many people know that you're blessed by God? How many people just, I mean, today we're blessed by God. Yesterday we're blessed by God. Tomorrow we'll be blessed by God. And um, God is so good to all of us, so good. And, and just don't miss that blessing that God does. Sometimes, uh, you know, you're growing up and, and we may not be appreciative of, of all the things that we have, but don't let it be that way. God has blessed us so much, and we got so much to be thankful for and so much to look forward to. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious Father, we love you. Father, thank you for all that you do, Father. Uh, thank you for this uh, class that's being taught. Uh, Father, thank you for allowing us to know that we are valued, uh, that we are important to you. Father, that uh, you have blessed us in so many ways, Father. Father, just uh, bless Matthew White as he brings the lesson. Uh, speak through him. Uh, allow us to hear what you have to say, Father. And Father, help us to just learn more about you in a more intimate way, Father, a deeper way. Have a deeper understanding about the word, Father. So, Father, we thank you so much. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's welcome Matthew White. Thank you. How's everybody doing today? Did I hear hot? I understand that. I tell everybody I'm not from Texas. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. It is way too hot. I believe that the Lord's presence may have left. Well, thank you for those who are here in person and those who are on the digital space online. Thank you for joining tonight for the blessing part two. And so I just want to start kind of with a recap of last week. So can anyone tell me how to de define the blessing? Does anybody remember how we defined it last week? started out and uh, by getting that blessing you have to be obedient to the word and that's how we get the blessing okay well when we look at the recap from last week when we look at the blessing defined there were many things that we said that lead to the blessing but kind of how we put it when asked was being valued being known and being loved by God So what makes the blessing? Last week we talked about the five things that make the blessing. And so that was meaningful touch, spoken words, expressing high value, picturing a spectral future, and an active commitment. So these are the things that we talked about last week that make what the blessing is and what the blessing looks like. And remember, there is no specific order. We meet people wherever they are in the process of this. And there's one more way that I think makes it a little bit easier to remember to practically define the blessing. So based on the things that we learned last week, we can see that the, the blessing is words and actions that provide a deep-rooted picture of affirmation in a person's mind and memory. 
So I want to get us as interactive as possible tonight. I want us to be able to talk to each other. And so we're going to break into our first activity. And so I want you guys to get into groups of two or three, kind of whatever may be in your row, and collaborate. But I want you to answer these three questions. So what is a memory you have of appropriate, meaningful touch? What are some ways that you've seen the power of touch used to heal? And what are some ways you've seen the power of touch cause harm? And so I'll give you guys a couple minutes to answer those questions and then be ready to share. And again, for the people online, what is a memory you have of appropriate meaningful touch? What are some ways you've seen the power of touch used to heal? And then what are some ways you've seen the power of touch cause harm? I'll give you guys about two more minutes. I see one group is ready. We'll guys have you start us out. All right, based on the three questions that are up, so what is a memory you have of appropriate meaningful touch? What are some ways you've seen the power of touch used to heal? Or what are some ways you've seen the power of touch cause harm? And you can answer any one of them. Okay, the first one, the memory of a pose of meaning, appropriate, meaningful touch is being baptized. Okay, do, do we want to answer more than one or? You can, but I, I would love for you to break that down. Why would you say that uh, it was meaningful touch for you when you were baptized? Um, just being renewed, you know, being born again. Just, that's, that's basically, it, you know, being baptized, knowing that, you know, um, I, I got baptized when I rededicated my life to Christ when I was young. And so 
a powerful experience. Did you want to answer another one? Um, well, the, some of the ways we've seen power of touch used to heal is when um, people pray with hands being laid on people in church. some ways you've seen the power of touch cause harm and that was when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. No, no, I take that back. That's when my mama touched me and said, this gonna hurt you more than, I mean, gonna hurt me more than hurt you. Well, I see we got some agreements on that and I believe the group up front had one as well. Um, what are some ways you've seen the power of touch cause harm. Or well, obviously when we was referring to the power of touch, we were referring to the power of being from above. So what was the power of touch from above? Obviously we had somebody that was in the upper room that was or rape, like that can be the harmful thing or the hurtful thing. That's what I was thinking as well, uh, because I was able to answer number two, what are some ways you've seen the power of touch used to heal? Mm -hmm. uh, about this time last year, um, I was on, my, on the phone. We were actually in the middle of Bible study, and I was on the phone with a friend, and he, and he actually shared with me that evening that, that actually dying and that he was saying goodbye. Uh, when I realized what he was saying, that hit me harder than I expected. Uh, the next thing I know, my wife is there with just being able to, to hold me in that moment of pain and devastation. And there was a healing touch in that for me, realizing that God had provided someone to give support at a moment where he knew I was it was not, not, it wasn't what she said or what she prayed. It was just a simple touch. And thank you for sharing that. That's definitely true. Um, and I kept it as broad as possible because whether it is a physical touch or looking at a supernatural touch, I think either really, can, it really goes with the blessing. And so I chose to, to take this this way. What is the memory you have of appropriate, meaningful touch? There's a clip that I want to share that really, I think, sums up meaningful touch in a physical sense. And so, if we can play the clip. Tom Hammond and Craig Mass back, back at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redmond of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redmond is out. Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team because he doesn't want anybody to help him. And it'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Oh, look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. The British have a certain tradition of running which you have to respect a bizarre finish to this first semi-final in the men's 400 meters Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch he's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane 
And now the pain too much. swelling throughout Olympic Stadium as Redman, with assistance this time, approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic spirit. The reason that I chose that clip, A, is because I love sports, but B, I think this was a powerful imagery of meaningful touch. Last week when we talked about meaningful touch, we talked about how it conveys warmth, affirmation, and acceptance. When we look at this video, this is Derek Redman. He's a sprinter for the UK. In the first round, he had the fastest time. So he's going to a second round, and he was out fine until he tore his hamstring. Imagine this is something that you train your life for. That only comes every four years and you have to make it. That there's no guarantee that you'll get this again. And his father Jim knew how big this moment was. That he got past security. We even saw him wave off another guy trying to get them off the track to help his son finish this race. And in the moment, this was the meaningful touch that his son needed. He needed someone to help him carry on when he couldn't carry himself. He needed someone that was conveying warmth, the affirmation, the acceptance, the love. And so now I wanna look at meaningful touch in the Bible. So the verse that I chose to focus on was Luke 5, 12 to 13, and I'll be reading from the CSB. It says, while he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus. He fell face down and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So why? is this passage a great representation of meaningful touch. When we look at the biblical culture, lepers were banished from society. They were people that were cast out because they were incurable, they were uh, transmissible, and it was fatal. And if you were to touch a leper, you would be deemed unclean. So I imagine at this moment, a man who had been an outcast, someone who had been in isolation, who was always on the outside looking in, what he wanted most was touch. He wanted to be affirmed, he wanted to be known by others. And Jesus could have just spoke the words and he'd be, he'd be healed. But we see before he spoke the words, Jesus touched him. Jesus restored that dignity in the moment. And so that's why I chose Luke 5, 12 through 13 in the story of the leper and the healing as meaningful touch. And then so next, I want to move to spoken words. We all know the power of our words. Our words have power. I'll never forget one day when I was working in college athletics, I had a young man sitting in my office. Bzz, 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 bzz. I'm like, all right, Who, who's calling you? Oh, no, it's text message. It's my coach. Okay. Well, he knows you're in study hall. Bzz, 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 bzz. Okay, can you just let him know again that you're meeting with me, that, you know, this is our time to get work done? All right, I will do. Bzz, 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 bzz. I said, what is your coach saying? 
the student athlete wouldn't dare read the words on the phone, but gave me the phone to read it myself. And I watched as the coach was doing a play-by-play -play of practice earlier and tearing him down with no intent to build him back up. So we don't often think about the power of our words and what they have. But for this young man who was a highly recruited kid, the power of his words meant so much that he felt like he was no one, that there was nothing that he could do, all because of a bad practice. And how do we convey that in our lives, where we may be having a bad day and the words that we speak we're not, that we don't hold ourselves accountable for? Spoken words convey the acceptance of someone, appreciation, encouragement. And so I want to play a short clip just on the power of our words so that we can think about how words not only affect people that we live with, our loved ones, if we have kids, family members, friends, but our words affect people. Take one. How are you? Good, I'm so glad to see you. At your house, what do you hear your mom and dad saying most often? Get off the couch. <laughs> Come over and do the dishwasher. <laughs> oh, go clean your room. Oh, hurry up, hurry up. And you need to do your laundry. I'm not warning you again. Be quiet. Why? Because we're really loud. Who took this? Who ate that? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? You're being distracting. Yeah. Like, I need you to calm down. Clean your room, do your chores. My dad says no. That's like right. all I hear. Okay. And, and what my you mom want? says, like, hurry up. What have you done productive today? To unload the dishwasher, to clean the table, to wash the dishes. Remember to bring your lacrosse stuff to lacrosse practice. Clean up your desk. How did you not find that? I was right there. <laughs> What's the nicest thing somebody's ever said to you? I'm funny and. My teacher says I have a good imagination. Someone said I like a really nice personality mm -hmm. and that I can be really respectful. Your smile is contagious. One of my friends said, like, you're the best person in the world. Really? How did that make you feel? Like somebody really cared about me. Yeah. My coach, I, I love him because yeah. even if we don't win or don't have a good mm -hmm. game, he'll be like, you guys did good, mm -hmm. and they'll tell us what we did best and what we need to work on. I like hearing good things about myself from someone else. Yeah. Has anybody ever said anything that hurt your feelings? Um, you're so obnoxious. Really? All the time. I hear that maybe once a day. Those little comments stick with me all the time. Mm -hmm. Someone at my school said I wasn't good at, like, a certain sport we were doing for PE. It made me feel kind of sad and that I should stop trying it. This kid said I was a waste of life. Oh, really? It's just no one's a waste of life, in my opinion. That's right. What's the very favorite thing your mom and dad have said to you? That they're proud of me? Yeah. They said you're gonna do great things one day. I love when my uh, mom and dad like say I'm awesome and cool, and like they love me. I like to hear like, good job, well mm -hmm. done, congratulations, stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's I love you. Really? I really like that. My mom says I'm special sometimes. Yeah. And my dad says I'm a really hard worker. Well, that must make you feel very valuable. It does. Mm -hmm. She says like I'm beautiful, smart, pretty, and stuff. Yeah. Makes me feel nice and makes me feel more confident and positive. My mom always tells me that like I'm the most determined, so that's always stuck with me. Like if I have a project, I just remember like I'm the most determined one. Mm -hmm. like, if I actually want to get this done, I can do it. My dad tells me very frequently, and my mom, my mom tells me this a lot too. I'm glad you are my son. Mm -hmm. I just love that. I think this is a small yet powerful clip that show the weight of words. We're often, we don't necessarily think about what we're portraying or what we're telling people. But if we're not careful, these things that we say become labels that someone wears in shame. They become the very bondage that someone lives in and needs to be freed from. And so I wanna move into activity two. And this is just an opportunity to be honest with our brothers and sisters tonight. And so, as we were before, you guys are already in groups. 
I just want you to answer three of these questions. Was there a time in your life when you missed the opportunity to hear a spoken message or to give one? Did your family have a spoken or unspoken rule about verb using verbal words to encourage? And what I mean by that was, was there a thought that love was implied by the things that were done for you and it wasn't spoken? And then are there words spoken or unspoken that you feel, that you feel are blocking you from blessing others? And so I want you guys to answer these questions in your group. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes to answer the question.
All right, I'll give you guys one more minute just to wrap it up because I see some good conversations happening. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. So the questions were, was there a time in your life when you missed the opportunity to hear a spoken message or give one? Did your family have a spoken or unspoken rule about using verbal words to encourage? Or are there words, spoken or unspoken, that you feel are blocking you from blessing others? group is going to do question one and the last question, um, but the first one is when my elders used to tell me not to do certain things, and I did them anyway, like don't hang out with that person, you're, you're, you know, you're getting in too much trouble, you need to change this and change that, you know, and it didn't listen when I should have. Um, the last one we came up with like when people tell you what was it again bro that you can't help everybody you know and that puts up a stigma that you you can only help certain people but in Christ you should help everyone so if I heard that correctly you're saying based on hearing from people that you can't help everyone you feel like that has been just a block for feeling like um, you can bless others or try to go out your way to bless all these people. Like saying that you can't help it, it puts limitations on, you know, helping, blessing people. When you should, you know, go above and beyond to help anyone in a time of need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a sports fanatic as well. Um, I feel like I missed the opportunity to speak to my high school football team during the playoff time, during the playoff game, halftime. Um, I really wanted to say something to my team um, at halftime, and that's something, something, something that I still think about to this day. I wish I would have, who knows if it would have made a difference or not, but um, I definitely feel like I missed that opportunity. Thank you for sharing that. Where's one right here real quick? I, uh, I was, we were talking about number two. Um, growing up, it was more of an unspoken rule. My mom, um, she always said, I love you. She would say it when you came home, when you went to bed. <laughs> she was on the laundry, doing the outside, hanging up clothes on the laundry. On the line, she would tell you she loved you. She'd have, like, it was, it was several of us, so she'd always have that time with just you, and she'd make sure that you knew that she loved you and you knew why she was telling you that she loved you so much because she said it all the time. And so she, the thing with this is that she grew up without it, so she wanted to make sure that she supplied it to, to us. So that was, uh, that was the one that stuck out for, for me. And how do you feel like that really just has impacted your life and the way that you love others? Um, I, I feel the same need to, to make sure that I express it to my nieces and my nephews that, that they know that they're loved and that they're, uh, they're cherished. And I've added that, uh, that they, and to encourage them that they know that God loves them uh, above all.
first get an honest God. Um, we did the third one. And um, when I was coming up as a child, um, my name was Dummy. <laughs> And uh, back then, they didn't know anything about having dyslexia. So for a long time, I carried that stigma of that I wasn't smart enough to do anything. So that kind of hindered me in trying to just read. I, I learned how to build. But I spoke with Mr. Buss last year and um, I just learned how to read at 55 years old. Amen. And thank you for sharing that. I think, um, like you said, as an example, and the spoken words that people say, they can, they can be something that stick on us and something that we, we have to work through and we have to find freedom from when the reality is this is what happens when we don't understand part of the blessing and that we need to speak life into people, that we have these opportunities to speak and encourage others because we will be held accountable for our words. And there are two verses that I chose for spoken words. And the first one is Hebrews 11.3. And again, this is going to be from the CSB. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by, by the word of God so that was made from things that are not visible. And so we ourselves do not have the power to manifest reality like God, but our words, our words have impact on people and we have to hold ourselves accountable for the things that we say. But we look at something in Hebrews 11.3 as, even as we look at Genesis, we see that as he spoke, things were created. That shows power of words. And then in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, it says, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned. And so again, as we look to bless others and part of the blessing is spoken words, let us choose every single day to be accountable of the words that we speak how we encourage our brothers that are struggling, how we look to meet the needs of someone on the day-to-day -day just with words of encouragement. I think about how oftentimes I stop at a gas station here in Dallas and there may be someone that is homeless that again doesn't want a single thing from me, but the moment that I stop and acknowledge them, I see a radical shift because these people are often just forgotten, treated as less than, but a simple thing of speaking words of encouragement, of acknowledging that this person is a human is enough to change that person's day. And then I want to talk about expressing high value. So this is where our words and our actions meet. We can look at all the other pieces of the blessing, but there has to be action for it to happen. So when we express high value in people, it shows an acknowledgement and encouragement. And then so for the last activity, I want you guys to have a time where you answer these questions. Is there something that blocks you from feeling you have value in God's eyes? If you were to write a letter, text, or a social media post that attaches high value to someone, what would it say? And then how does appropriate, meaningful touch communicate high value to someone? So again, the questions are, is there something that blocks you from feeling you have value in God's eyes? If you were to write a letter, text, or put a social media post up that attaches high value to someone, what would, what would it say? And how does appropriate, meaningful touch communicate high value to someone?
All right, I'll give you guys about two more minutes. All right, let's bring it back to the group. And so the questions that we're answering are, is there something that blocks you from feeling you have value in God's eyes? If you were to write a letter, a text, or social media post that attaches high value, what would it say? And how does appropriate, meaningful touch communicate high value to someone? And then so can we start in the back? to number three. Um, I feel like if I was to start off with like, uh, good morning, how you, how you doing? Uh, you look nice today. Keep up the good work. You know, I, I feel that that can have meaningful communication, high value for someone to that day. That's just my answer to number three. That's how I feel. Thank you. I definitely think, like you said, those words of encouragement can, ha can add high value, and you never know what someone has experienced on their day-to-day, -day and that you choose to speak life and to add value and show them that they are valuable. And uh, I actually want to read really quickly online. We had some comments um, about meaningful touch, and one was uh, from Diane Robinson saying, receiving hugs from family and grandmother would kiss her on the forehead. And it's those things that grandma was just showing her love and an outpouring of love and how that's impacted her life. And then um, from Lou Blackburn, meaningful touch indicates that someone is with you. We have a lot of reasons not to touch someone. So when a person is open enough to hug you or give you a handshake, it feels special. I will answer number two and three. Last summer, my granddaughter worked on a project. I didn't write a letter or send a text or post social media, but I worked along with her in critiquing and suggesting and listening and listening over and over on the presentation that she was preparing to sell something. She won second place. And just to go through that experience with her, I attached high value to that. And I believe she received it that way. And then uh, the third bullet, how does appropriate, meaningful touch communicate high value. 
We were both just hugging and congratulating. I was and congratulating her. And uh, she got a prize. She got money. All that just was wonderful to experience that with her. That is awesome. I think as you hit on, like, she saw the commitment. She saw the value that you saw. This was something valuable. And then in the end with second place and all the things that she got, there was a loving hug. And that just shows that, hey, I value you. I value this time together. Like, thank you for allowing me to do this with you. And uh, I want to answer number one. Uh, is there something that blocks you from feeling you have value in God's eyes? And I was saying that as I was growing up as a child uh, on TV, uh, the blacks were not portrayed that well on TV. Usually in a, any type of episode, they were the first ones being killed. Uh, they were looked upon as the pimp or the game banger or something to that effect or the f black family was not portrayed right. All those type of things. I remember um, uh, I was watching Shaka Zulu. Some of you people around my age are older and they had on TV, this is back in the, I don't know what it was, 80s or maybe even 70s, but naked women, uh, especially their breast part. And I was thinking back then, they would never do that to any other race. Never would. And so I think if sometimes society puts these stereotypes, and if we're not careful, they can block our value in God's eye. We can let those define us. And number two, I think, is the answer to number one. I think what gives high value a text or a social media post, it would be a Bible passage telling that God loves us and what God thinks of us. Because that overrides or overrides anything anybody else may think about us. Thank you for that, Pastor Wilson. That was definitely just in a very real and true thing that we see is that oftentimes um, African Americans, whether it's the family, male, woman, are portrayed a certain way. And if we are not on guard, if we're not careful, if we don't know who we are and whose we are, we'll start attaching that image to ourselves, and then we'll say, well, I'm not good enough for God. And there is something that we, me and my wife have definitely been intentional about is with our daughter. We find every book that we can that has a little girl that looks like her because I want her to see that she's a beautiful black girl. I want her to know at home that she is loved, that she's affirmed, and that she's known by me and my wife, but also by God, most importantly. But I want her to see in the writing, the things that she reads, and the TV shows that she watches, that black is beautiful too. That you are beautiful in God's eyes, that God made you how he did on purpose. And so thank you for that. Is there anyone else? Did I miss anyone? All right, well, we have, looks like five minutes left. I wanna open the floor up to any questions. You know, my, um, a lot of you know my son, Major, and he has a song out called Why I Love You. And actually, it was the number one wedding song, but it's actually a love letter to God. And a lot of people don't know that. And it has 33 million views on YouTube. And I remember when it first came out, I was just so happy and bragging to people. And they said, man, your son won't be famous until he gets at least a million views. And everyone talks about him. Now he has 33 million, 300 million views, and people still don't even realize it's a letter to God, talking about how he loves God and thanks him for what he's done for him. And when I saw the letter, the text, or social media, you know, he's all over social media, and so that's 3 million people that, 300 million people that sees that and hears that and don't even realize what they're listening to. It is awesome the things that God will use to reach people to know of his love for them. And that is an example. Thank you for sharing that. Does anyone have any questions or anything to add? We talked about spoken words and how important they are. 
and we talk about affirming and things of that nature, which is extremely important. One thing I thought about after we had closed that session out was sometimes a special word or affirming word is an apology. Mm. Just saying I'm sorry, you know, uh, having your father say I'm sorry, having your mother say I'm sorry. I know in many households like mine, that was extremely rare. And so, but saying I'm sorry to your spouse or uh, just being able to humble yourself, that gives value to that other person. I'm sorry if I took too long. No, that was perfect. It was, it was convicting. That's why <laughs> I felt that. Um, anyone else have anything to add or any questions? All right, if not, I'll pray us out. Um, Father God, we just thank you for tonight. We just thank you for the opportunity to get to meet. Father, we don't take it for granted. I thank you for those who are in person and those who are online. Um, just making time to, Father, just to learn more about the blessing. Father, I pray for those who have never experienced a blessing. I pray that you allow us, as they have this time here with us, Father, allow them to experience part of the blessing through us, Father. Whether it's meaningful touch, whether it's spoken word, it's high value, Father, whatever it may be, help us to meet those needs so they can see the blessing. Father, I pray that you keep us safe as we leave tonight, and I pray that you just continue to always keep us on mission. Father, thank you for loving us and imperfect people. For any of us who have a, a boundary or a blind rub that says, God can't love me because whatever, Father, I pray that that boundary falls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.